Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this workshop, Matt Malencia. Um, we're really excited to have him as our workshop leader. Matt is a PhD student at Penn in electrical and systems engineering. And throughout his uh, career and time in his education, Matt has volunteered countless hours to improving both his own science communication skills and improving those of other scientists and engineers, both at Penn and elsewhere. Um, when he was at Penn State for his undergrad, he served as an engineering ambassador. And uh, last year, he conducted our scientific presentations workshop. And his workshop was so popular and so well reviewed that we asked him to please come back and do it again. So we are delighted that he has agreed to give our workshop today. And without further ado, I will turn it over to him. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And hello to everyone. I see in the comments right now we have a fellow engineering ambassador in the audience. So that is always great to see. Um, today's talk obviously is going to be about science presentations and specifically I want to give you guys the tools to continue to improve your clarity and your efficacy in your scientific presentations because I'm a firm believer that science that is not communicated is science that is not done. It is, you, are, you are not making any progress until you have effectively communicated it to others. Who those others can be, we'll talk about it could be a lot of different people. Um, but thank you to PSPDG and Aaron and everyone for setting this up and for organizing this. Thank you to everyone who is here. I know, you know, 2020 has been crazy. Um, even this week, um, for those who don't know, I'm actually in London currently. I live abroad. I'm working with Cambridge. So I've been in lockdown a little bit longer than everyone in Philadelphia. Um, but I do, you know, feel the pain and um, it's, it's hectic and it can, uh, really feels draining sometimes. So I appreciate everyone being here and I invite everyone just to take a deep breath and be present here because this workshop is going to be very interactive. Um, I'm gonna have you guys doing a lot. I'm a firm believer that uh, all of communication and especially public speaking comes with practice. And so you guys will be practicing today as well as uh, learning some new things. And so one of the ways that we're going to kind of have interaction is through the Zoom buttons. So if you've never used it, uh, click on the participants panel to open that up and give me, if everyone could just click the yes button to give me confirmation that you've found the buttons, you are here with me, uh, confirm that you're going to be mentally and physically present and that you are ready to participate. Um, the other way that this is going to be interactive is we are going to be doing breakout groups. And so I'm sending everyone a link right now that you should have open because every time we have a breakout group, this is going to have kind of the instructions for you. I will be talking about them, but um, I see a lot of people already opening that up. So we're gonna go right into our first activity, which is just to get some people talking, introduced to each other, and for me to kind of hear a little bit about um, what you already think of you know, presenting. So I want you guys just to introduce each other and then talk about, you know, what you see as being good and um, bad in presentations that you've seen. So hear from you guys, share some of um, uh, the main, main things you guys discussed in what sticks out as bad about um, presentations and what sticks out as good in presentations. And go ahead and unmute yourself and share. Um, so we had an interesting uh, parallel in uh, two suggestions. Um, so I suggested uh, like lots of math in a presentation is bad and um, someone else suggested uh, like lots of figures with no guiding text. Um, and I think the common common theme there is sort of like too much information not given enough actual attention in the um, in the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Other people, what did you guys talk about? One uh, other point that our group discussed was uh, if uh, the presenter is talking really fast and you cannot really keep up with what's going on and then you just stop listening at some point. Great, yep. Keep going, I need one or two more people to share. Um, someone in our group brought up the cohesiveness of the presentation, so if it feels like there's not a narrative story throughout, then it's bad. Great, one more person. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves, broadcast, 
uh, is when um, the speaker kind of overestimates the the knowledge of the audience and talks in a lot of jargon and assumes you know things uh, and points at grass and says things like obviously blah 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 and uh, most of the time yes we like we are graduate students here at PhD students are very intelligent but you can't overestimate uh, you know the background knowledge that your audience has uh, you really have to meet them at their level um, yeah. the curse of knowledge it's called great yeah absolutely thank you all for sharing um, in this presentation I, you know I, I'll share some tidbits of, of different things what that reminded me of one of the uh, you know base assumptions that I start with and then you know I work from is this assumption that my audience members are very intelligent but not very knowledgeable so I assume they know nothing, but they have the ability to understand complex topics. And so that, that is kind of the framing that I can use. One thing that you guys probably noticed is it's really easy to identify things that we don't like. It is harder to identify things that we do um, like. And, and one of the reasons for this is because often what we know about presentations and, and what we see as bad are stylistic. And so, um, the to, to kind of frame what I mean by stylistic, if we think about writing, stylistic is grammar, syntax, sentence structure, those kinds of things. So for example, if I give you the sentence, John, who when Julie left, arrived, left, that sentence is grammatically correct, syntactically correct, uh, uh, has a sentence structure that, you know, is allowed, but I'm sure none of you understood a thing I just said. And we've definitely had presentations that are similar, where they follow the rules that we might have about you know um, uh, that we might know stylistically about presentations, and so some of these bad style things in presentations. I want to just rip through some examples for you. So um, standard advice being you know don't use weird fonts, crazy decorations, bad colors that you can't read, fonts that are too small to read, bullet points. Some people hate bullet points. Um, people who hide behind the lectern or, or talk to the slides instead of talking to their audience. Uh, slides that are only words, or even worse, when people just copy paste paragraphs from their presentation or from their uh, papers. Uh, people who throw all the data at you, don't tell you, you know, what it means or how to parse through it, um, or ones that throw all the plots at once, and then they especially love to tell you, I'm throwing all these plots at you, just but just look at this only this one, um, or of course what I'm doing now, people who throw a million things at you in one slide, and of course I love. Um, awesome transitions. Um, but like I said, I want to focus not on the stylistic. This is the advice that I've seen a lot of people talk about, and some of you have already identified. I'm hoping to give you something different and what I think is more helpful in the long run, and that is things, advice that is structural. So um, to kind of give a notion of what um, structural versus stylistic is, I want to take a poll uh, and it requires all of you to think back to your childhood. So question is whether when you learned to ride a bike, if you did, did you have training wheels or did you use a balance bike or neither? So if you had training wheels, give me a yes button. And if you had a balance bike, give me a no button of yeses. So as I suspected, majority were using training wheels. So um, Training wheels are about style. They are about quickly getting to the point where it looks like you know what you're doing, but it's not actually teaching you fundamentals. The whole point behind a balance bike is for you to first learn a fundamental principle of biking, such as balance. And so today I wanna to focus on the fundamental principles of presentations and give you those core things that you can build on top of with all of this stylistic advice that you know, is, is more readily available and more maybe obvious to us, but I want to give that good foundation. And so I'm going to pull from three main sources today, and these are um, on the left, a, a book called Trees, Maps, and Theorems, um, and it specifically is Communication for the Rational Mind, which resonates with me and I'm sure many of you. This was written by an engineer, a PhD in applied physics from Stanford University. Um, the second book here is one I actually recently ran into and have been loving. It's by Matt Carter, and he's an associate professor in biology. And then the last thing is from my experience and from the people who taught me, Michael Alley and Melissa Marshall. Um, he is has a bachelor in electrical engineering and a master's in fine arts and writing. 
and Melissa Marshall does like advertising, PR, and communications. So a lot of what they've talked about form uh, are, are in agreement with each other and form kind of a, a cohesive message. And to me, that's really powerful because we have engineers, PhDs, um, biologists, people who do communications for a living, and all of them are generally in agreement on what these fundamental principles are and what makes presentations good. And so that's kind of all the experience that I'm pulling with that I hope to um, give to you guys so that you can use to continually improve your presentations. After the workshop, um, we have an exit survey. I'm going to, uh, if you complete it, uh, you will be sent some of these materials and like some handouts that will hopefully be like quick guides as reminders of how to approach these things. So uh, this talk is going to include uh, one definition, three fundamental laws or principles of communication, and then I'm going to dive into three main topics, which are how to apply these principles in your content, in your slide design, and in your delivery. So let's dive right in. The first thing before we really start is with a definition, and this is the definition of a message. Most of the time when, especially a scientist, we think about information and data, I want you guys to get thinking about a message. And a message is a so what rather than a what. And so the goal of communication generally is to get your audience to pay attention to, understand, and act on a maximum number of messages. In any presentation we do, we're going to provide information, but that's kind of the bare minimum. To really move forward, we want to get our audience to act on messages. And so when possible in this talk, I want to give you guys very tangible examples. And so being an engineer, I'm gonna give some uh, examples from my background, and then I'm gonna give some more bio-related stuff. Julia from PSP PDG helped me out, gave me some, some slides and content that hopefully, you know, I might not know what they mean because I'm not a bio person, but hopefully for those who are bio people, it will um, help be a demonstrable example for you guys. So I wanna give you some examples of information versus message. The first is from a paper that I actually just submitted like a month ago. So um, information that I would communicate is that we assume that the functions that I'm using are super modular. Right now we don't care what super modular is. This is just you know, equivalent to me putting a topic statement of assumptions, pretty common. The message though is the so what? Why do we care about these assumptions? And the message that I chose is that making this assumption enables tractable solutions. This isn't the only message that can be communicated with this information. So for example, you could talk about how this um, assumption is um, natural for this use case or is appropriate for the real world. You could talk about how it's not restrictive or less restrictive than the usual assumptions, but that's gonna be, you know, that's up to you as you're going through the process of designing that presentation. Uh, an example in bio is um, the plot shows the effect of um, pretty much the effect of X on Y. That is something that we all know is having a slide where we talk about a plot showing the effect of X on Y. But if you want to make this into a message, you want to actually tell people why does that effect matter? What is the effect? So here, uh, the fact that it actually has no effect is what's important. And again, these are examples, but for a given piece of information, there are many different messages that you could have. And so uh, with the example of, you know, plotting X versus Y, it could be about why this relationship is important, what the relationship is, um, or like, why should people care about that message or that data? So that's one of the core uh, ideas with all of this is a focus on messages. So now we can talk about what the fundamental principles of communication are. And these are three things that maybe this slide, if I had to say, is probably the one of the most important of the presentation is the three fundamental laws of communication. First, adapt to your audience. So all communication is persuasion. You're constantly persuading people to pay attention to what you're saying, but different audiences care about different so what's, different messages. The second fundamental law of communication is maximize signal to noise ratio. You have to admit to yourself that the audience will not remember everything you said, and you don't want them to. So your main message is your signal, everything else is noise. Talks are not meant to be comprehensive, 
So you don't need people to remember all the details. You know, there's a spectrum from, you know, a report which conveys every single detail to a story which is just eliciting an emotional response. Presentations are often very much so in the middle here, but you want to have a main signal because you're, they're not gonna remember everything. The last one is to use effective redundancy. And so we're gonna talk about this in terms of the different channels by which people get information from you as a presenter. So like I said, this is probably one of the most important slides and these might feel vague to you. And one of my frustrations is when presentation advice feels vague. So the rest of this presentation is about giving you very tangible ways to put these fundamental laws into action. And specifically, I'm going to be doing that in three main sections. So talking about the design of the presentation and the content, the visuals, and the delivery. And so section one, I'm gonna go through some of the material and approaches to applying these laws, and then we're gonna have our main activity, and you guys will be applying those principles. And then section two, I'll talk about visual design in section three, briefly on you know, actually talking and delivering uh, the, pre uh, the presentation or the speech that you're giving. So I'm gonna take another poll we all know the questions, who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, this one actually is not going to be a poll, but instead we're going to use everyone in the chat function. So uh, I'm going to have you guys type in and then simultaneously hit enter so that we all kind of see this flood of, of answers from everyone. So first, which of these questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how, do you feel you put the most thought into when you're preparing for a presentation and when you're creating a presentation? So think about those six and which of those do you put the most thought into? Type it into the chat and I'll let you know in, in one second. Go ahead and hit enter so we can see. I see lots of what's, some why's, some who's. Great. Awesome, lots of what's and why's. And a question of who? Great, awesome guys. So um, generally the where, when, and how are given to us, the how being, you know, what type of presentation, whether it's gonna be a poster presentation or slides or just oral. Um, the why uh, we're definitely gonna talk about uh, is like, you know, why even talk to you guys? Um, and the what, uh, I feel a lot of people definitely, no matter what, spend a lot of time, that's, you know, our content and, and the uh, items that we are communicating. And, um, the argument that I want to make is that the order of these might, uh, you know, you, you can't always design a presentation in the order of why, who, what, but this is the priority that you should take. The, the number one thing that you should identify is why you are giving a presentation and then who and really diving into the assumptions you're making about that who and then the what is the content. So specifically when I talk about purpose, uh, I want to answer the question, what should the audience do after my presentation? Or what should the audience be able to do after my presentation? And a quote I heard recently, even if you're invited or required to give a presentation, you should come to a presentation as if you sought out that opportunity to share a message or invoke an action. All too often I hear people when I say, you know, why are you giving this presentation? The answer is, it's required by the conference. It's my turn to give a lab presentation. Um, uh, I know it's good to practice. And that's really not uh, getting to the core purpose of what you want your audience to do after you are done presenting. So again, to give some tangible examples, in this presentation, what I want you to do, my purpose, is for you to use the tools that I give you so that you are able to improve your science presentations. Um, I do outreach a lot also, so some outreach could have the purpose of recruitment. It could be, you know, I want a student to pursue STEM because of my presentation. I want a student to read more about STEM because of my presentation. Or maybe I want them to feel a sense of belonging in STEM, like they could be part of that community. And for a conference, there's some you know, it could be that you want people to read and cite your paper. It could be that you want to form collaborations. It could be that you want to, them to come talk to you at your poster session. 
And so really focusing on what you want your audience to do and who your audience is and how you get them to do that thing is important. So uh, in terms of the fundamental laws that we've talked about, um, prioritizing and focusing on purpose is how we adapt to a specific audience. And by focusing on this, we can maximize our signal to noise ratio because anything that we're trying to decide if we should include in our presentation or not include in our presentation, we can ask ourselves, does this serve and support my purpose and my message? So now that we have a purpose, we want to structure our content. And one of the big things here again to reiterate is this notion of messages. And so for any presentation, you should have a main message. Again, not information, not a core uh, piece of data, but a core message. And then we're going to create main points, sub messages based on that support this main message. And then from there, you can create supporting material and content and evidence that you know these main messages, evidence that support these main messages or show that these main messages are true. And now often these sub points here align pretty well with the slides that you actually create in the content, um, but not, you know, maybe not precisely. And so when we talk about, you know, adapting to an audience, it's about designing the main message and the sub messages that best serve the audience and serve your purpose. When we talk about maximizing signal to noise ratio, this structure is really important. So this is a tree structure. Most of the time when we create presentations, we create it in a chain. We say A, then B, then C, then D, then E. What this structure does first off, it is uh, a chain of ideas is only as strong as its weakest link, where essentially as you dive into a tree, if you lose someone, you don't necessarily lose the entire tree. And so when we're actually presenting structurally, we want to go through this content in the same way that this tree is structured. We want to dive down in the tree, but then come back up before we move over. So you don't just go from orange dot to orange dot, you bring them back to the bigger ideas before diving in again. And so the, the, last, um, the last principle or law that I talked about is redundancy. And following this structure is one way that you can use redundancy. So instead of just presenting sub point after sub point after sub point, you follow the structure, you start at a high level, you dive in, and then you pull back out. And when you do that, you can reiterate how your sub points supported your sub message and main message, main message and how everything ties together before you dive back in to another deep dive of, a, of sub points. And so an example of, you know, if you wanted a recipe to do this, I, I don't recommend using recipes, but this is an approach that I've found is, is helpful to formulate a talk as a whole. And that is identifying a need. And, and in academia, we talk a lot about a gap that exists. This is a need, you know, the difference between what uh, exists in the world and what should exist. So for example, the need and the gap that I identified here is we know in scientific presentation, we know a lot about a lot of stylistic ways to improve, but the gap is that we need to know structural ways to improve our presentations. So this kind of just lays out how you can quickly get the audience from knowing nothing, assuming knowing nothing about this topic, to identifying and resonating with the need and with your main message before you then start to dive into these main points. So with that, this is um, you know, applying the laws to the structure of our presentations. And so in order to do this, we are going to have an activity so that you can put this to practice. And so what we're going to be doing is this activity, you guys are going to be giving a two minute um, presentation to each other. You're just gonna be talking to one other person, so it's pretty low stakes. A two minute presentation pitching your discipline. So persuade someone to take up your course of studies. And so um, you're gonna break down into, you know, get specific with what the audience is, design your presentation, and then have some practice. So the next 15 minutes, we're gonna be going into breakout rooms and 
you guys are going to have these 15 minutes to design and practice. At the end of these 15 minutes, you should be ready to present your two minute talk I have a question. Um, so I am a first year and I do not have much to present as in like what I'm doing or mm -hmm. how I've addressed these things. So how do you suggest someone that is like has these ideas <laughs> but doesn't actually have anything that they've done kind mm. of thing? Yeah. So um one piece of advice I would say is um, definitely still find opportunities to present something and something technical. So, um, I mean, I mentioned that I published uh, or hmm, I submitted, hopefully published uh, a paper like last month. That was my first paper. I'm a, I'm a third year and that's my first first author paper. So like, that's my baby. Um, I've found opportunities to present technical content. So for example, in, electrical and systems engineering, we have uh, a colloquium that's just for PhD students. And a lot of people talk about the work they've done, the work they've they're doing. Um, I just picked a topic that I was interested in. One I think I learned a bit about in class and I thought, you know, this is good, useful information for people generally and to put it in the context of robotics because it was computer vision. So um, uh, I gave a presentation on that in the colloquium. And so um, that is something I would definitely encourage. And I can tell you as someone who has on rare occasions found materials and like presentations that do a phenomenal job at explaining one little thing. So for example, if anyone's on the call who knows what a common filter is, I learned it like two times before finding a blog online randomly. And when I spread that blog, I was like, this is amazing. I, I finally get it. I know what a common filter is now. And so going through the process of just like thinking about a, a, a new way to visualize or teach a technical con, uh, concept is one really useful to peers. Like I love when people do that and it's a really good exercise. Yeah. One of the things and, and uh, that's difficult as, as you keep shortening this, uh, these presentations is oftentimes the inclination is, is you know, trying to commute all of, uh, communicate all of the information. And often if you have, you know, these core messages and these main messages, you can whittle down to those. And so as you tend to a shorter and shorter presentation, you should tend toward just your main message and just your sub messages um, rather than, you know, all the details and evidence that come in the trees. One thing that's really interesting is when we think about designing presentations, we actually usually design them in this same order is, you know, we start with our, our paper and everything. We have, you know, hundreds of slides maybe, we have lots of content and we start whittling down of what we should include, what we shouldn't include. Instead, what we should do is we should build up. And so really the approach that is the best to take here is to start with Imagine you were giving a 30 second version of your presentation. What is the main message that you would say to people? And that is one way to help identify what that core message is. And then you can build up from there. And so the details that come should be, you know, in a conversation, all of you, this is your work. So once you have these main messages that you want to communicate, you should be able to talk about them to pretty much anybody because no one knows their work better than you. So hopefully that uh, helped give you guys some practice on um, creating presentations, following this idea of messages in this uh, structure of a tree. And like I said, one really good pra practice, especially in long presentations, is to dive into the tree and then to come 
out to bring it back to the big picture. So the image on the right here is um, you know, a visualization of technical depth diving in. And usually in a presentation, we dive in and then we stay deep all the way. And then you say, so in conclusion, and everybody perks up because they love those words. Um, and instead, we want to give them that opportunity. We know that you know, you're going to lose some people partway through. Maybe it's because it's out of their technical knowledge. Maybe it's because um, you know, it's earlier than they want to be up or they were up late last night working on something. So you want to give opportunities for them to come back into the conversation. And so that's what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take a second to bring everyone back into the conversation. And often uh, these like outline slides are a really great way to do that. A stylistic choice that I'm showing here is that I, I often make them a different color. So it indicates to people visually that this is like a checkpoint in the presentation. And so I can review um, for the people who were lost, uh, and I can tell you guys, you know, so far we learned about the three laws of communication, adapting to your audience, maximizing signal noise ratio, and using redundancy. And specifically, the first section was about designing the content and structure of the presentation in line with these three laws. And so we achieve this by focusing on the purpose of our presentation, that is, what action we want our audience to take and what messages are most appropriate for that audience. And then redundancy is what I'm doing now structurally, as I'm backing up to this big picture to tell you what, you know, all the depth we've just covered and review it before moving forward. So now that we're moving forward, we get to talk about visual design. So um, a poll from everyone, give me a yes or no. Did you guys go to the data visualization workshop last, month maybe okay good so i'm seeing some yeses some noes um for those who did i'm not going to repeat what we learned there all of those when you're designing slides all of you know the visualization techniques um are useful and needed when designing slides but i'm going to talk about um you know a structure within which you can use those tools and for those who weren't there, I suggest um, listening to that recorded talk if you can. Um, yeah, Alice just said it's on PSPDG YouTube. Uh, I thought it was an awesome workshop, so I would suggest it. One thing that Stephen had said that really resonated with me is he said software defaults are rarely our friends. Uh, and it's so true because often when we think about software defaults, they're not, uh, they're, they're made maybe to be easy for those who are creating content, not necessarily to be good for those who are on the receiving end of content. So when I talk about design, not just visual design, it's about rejecting these defaults and being purposeful and deliberate in how we communicate. So I want to talk a little bit about the defaults that exist in slide design, in PowerPoint or you know, whichever slides, Google Slides that you use. And so in order to do that, I have to go back to the 1980s, 1987 to be precise. So 1987 was the year after the Challenger explosion, the year President Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, um, the year of the Black, market, uh, the Black Monday stock market crash, and unfortunately, uh, the year we got PowerPoint and the defaults that came with it. And so this is what the defaults in 1987 looked like. PowerPoint was originally created for overhead transparencies, which some of you might remember, um, but the uh, defaults have not changed much since. So the defaults look almost identical and there's actually some fun quotes from the creators of PowerPoint who are pretty much saying why the hell are people still using these defaults. So the question is how should we be designing slides because we know the defaults of scientific presentations right now are maybe good for the speaker but not for the audience and so there's huge potential to create slide design in a way that is specifically geared towards furthering audience understanding. And so I mentioned earlier that one of my you know, teachers and mentors was Michael Alley. And essentially what he did was he said, you know, my background's engineering science. Can I take the scientific method to this question? So first, yeah, I had to, had to identify the problem with defaults. And I identified that it hindered audience understanding and that it was not aligned with the fundamentals of communication. So we see that titles are usually this um, 
topic word, which is meta discourse. So it just tells you what you're going to talk about. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you more information. It doesn't tell a message. Um, bullets are default. They're not inherently bad, but they often lead to the usage of too many words, to the use of smaller figures, and they're taking up a lot of useful space. And all of this in, in the fact that this hinders audience understanding is supported by his research and research done at Princeton, Yale, Harvard, MIT on cognitive science, psychology, neuroscience of learning, all of these. And all of them talk about, you know, some of them hate on PowerPoint. Some of them say, you know, PowerPoint isn't inherently bad, just the way we use it. Um, but again, it all comes down to being purposeful with how we use it. And so um, Michael Alley, coming back to this scientific method, said, how do we test a new design to see if it is actually better? And so he um, established a, a, a test to be able to actually study this. And so what he did was he created new slides in accordance with this research on learning, and he tested with two groups. What they did was they recorded a script and created automatic advancing slides. This was about MRI components and um, the process that MRIs go through and stuff like that. And he created um, topic subtopic slides and assertion evidence slides. Uh, I'm pretty sure he actually worked with an expert in MRIs for them to create these two slides. And he presented those automatic advancing slides with the same exact recorded script being spoken and then tested people on their recall and their understanding. And so with the new slides, they had a 59% um, recall or understanding compared to 42, which is a pretty good improvement. I think the biggest thing that this research speaks to is misconceptions. So there was only 5% misconceptions in this, with this new slide design as compared to nearly half of the people having a major misconception. Um, and that's huge. The other thing that he tested was not just what effect does this have on the audience, but does this have any effect on the presenter? And so he went through a very similar process and had, you know, gave people a script and said, create slides. For some of them, they said, just, you know, create slides. The other, they said, here are the guidelines of this new design for visual slide design. Follow them if you want. And then tested them again. They weren't you know, expecting a quiz, but quiz them on whether they tested better in understanding and whatnot, and saw that there was an improvement in understanding. And this supports some other research that is pretty much getting at the point that going through the process of turning information into messages is really helpful for researchers in understanding their own work um, and, and gaining depth and, you know, nuance in that understanding and understanding in a way by which they can better teach others. And so it's not just beneficial for the audience, but beneficial to those creating the slides. So what is this method? It's pretty simple. The assertion evidence style replaces topic headings, which are like results or conclusion with an assertion. Here, an assertion is a message, right? It's getting some point across rather than just telling a topic. And then replacing you know, bullets and words with visual evidence. Because at the end of the day, PowerPoint and similar software, their strength is in being able to visualize things and create visual evidence. And so we need to use that for what you know, their strengths lend them to. And so if you have an existing slide, a really easy way to transition to assertion evidence is think about what your message of that slide is, put that literally on the slide, and then if you have visuals, Make those larger or create visuals if you need to. And if you're planning slides from scratch, again, it's starting from these messages, creating slides around these messages and these ideas and creating visuals that are evidence that support these messages or these assertions. One thing I also want to note here is use the notes section. For a lot of people, one of the hesitancies in changing slide design and whatnot is a worry that they need those slides in order to present. And the notes section is something that is really helpful. Presenter view is a thing. If you, if you don't know what it is, look into it. it. It is a useful tool to give you kind of more confidence or comfort as you continue you know, gaining um, confidence as a presenter. Um, and it promotes good, uh, one other big uh, best practice when it comes to presentations, and that is using handouts. 
So presentations are not, presentation slides are not good standalone. If you don't have me talking you through slides, you're probably missing a lot. But if everything is on the slide such that you don't need me, then why am I here? Why am I even talking to my audience? Why am I having this dialogue? And so by using the notes section, you can literally print out and what I do when I share my slides is I print it as a note section or a slide with notes section. And if you want to make it like really pretty, you can adjust uh, the notes template to do this. But even the basic format formed a really nice PDF handout where you can communicate all that information while still having slides that are really great for the presentation itself. And so it really allows you to do kind of the best of both. Now, again, I wanted to give you guys some examples throughout. And so I'm going to give an example of um, how I use the search and evidence in some uh, recent presentations, again, on some very technical topics. And uh, the first is I'm using the assumptions that I talked about earlier, the example of the technical assumption that I made. So here at the top, I have um, a more expanded message than what I had earlier of the assumptions that I made and why I made those assumptions. And then there are two visuals that I gave and each of these visuals is a visual representation of each of those assumptions. And so one common maybe complaint or pushback that I receive is like, I have, I have too much math that I have to show. I have to show the math. And I'm, I'm not saying that you don't. The math is important to, to show and sometimes you need to but I would urge people to think about how they can use PowerPoint as a visual tool to strengthen that math because PowerPoint is inherently visual, slides are visual. And so I wanna ask people to you know, critically think, is this just an excuse? Are you just being lazy because you don't wanna create visuals? Um, and I know making visuals takes time and effort, but what you get out of it is larger impact. And so here's an example of how I use math, but the visual strengths of of presentations. So here I'm highlighting the two assumptions that I make and I'm highlighting what impact they have on my math, how they change my um, optimization um, problem here. Um, so that's an example in engineering. I also want to give an example in uh, bio. Uh, again, I don't maybe know exactly what um, all of these words mean and everything, but the message is stated at the top here. And there's only one figure instead of, you know, what we sometimes see being tons of figures. And note that the image is large so people can see it, people can read it. And what's really nice is when you use messages, the messages guide the audience about what to look for in the data or in the plot. And simultaneously, the data supports this message. And so um, this is, you know, hopefully some examples that show you assertion evidence in action. These are both also examples that have been used by technical people in the last few months at Penn. So hopefully those are, are useful as you start thinking about how to use this method. Um, I wanna leave this section with visual design with a few random tidbits because I think they're important. Um, one is the idea that perfection is not when you have nothing to add, but when you have nothing to take away. This is really related to the notion of the principle of progressive disclosure. One huge thing about slide design as compared to every other type of presentation, you know, oral presentation or poster presentation, is you as the presenter really have control over the flow of information. This is both a power and a responsibility, uh, but I would suggest only show things that you want the audience to look at at that moment. So if it doesn't have utility for them to look at it, it's going to be distracting. Um, so for example, lots of people put a logo on every slide or their institution name or the name of the event or the date. And I've been thinking about this and, and recently I've been putting these things onto my outline slides because you know if people are joining and, and bringing people back together during those checkpoints in my presentation, uh, I thought that's a good time to remind them, you know, my name's Matt and uh, here's my email if you need. Um, but one question I have for you guys is, um, you guys could probably see me, you've, you've been watching me talk for an hour now. Who here at some point, whether when I 
was first introduced or at any point during this presentation took note of the painting I have in my room here. Give me a yes or no if you noticed that painting. Oh, awesome, that's what I expected, lots of green. So I actually made the choice to leave uh, that uh, painting up. So usually with, with some software, I have the ability to blur my background. Um, it doesn't, I'm not gonna show you how horrendous it is when I try on Zoom, uh, but other times I'll, I'll take it down because to me, obviously that adds nothing. It is just a distraction. Um, but this is what I imagine is a, many times when you have a logo on every single slide. It is just something that is drawing the attention away from you and your content and your messages. And so sometimes you can have it on some slides, but I would just you know, be critical and, and think about why do you have it there. So uh, that section was about assertion evidence and the assertion evidence design. And obviously we have three uh, core laws that I want to always come back to, the first being adapting to your audience. Assertion evidence, as I went through, you know, the scientific process here was literally created and tested to maximize audience retention. When it comes to signal to noise ratio, assertion evidence uh, really forces you as a creator of a presentation to focus on messages and to reinforce those messages with visual evidence, because that's what PowerPoint is good for, is creating visuals. Uh, and also, again, to get rid of super, uh, like superfluous things like this painting here. And then redundancy is really core to assertion evidence because it's this idea that the audience is receiving your message through what she hears, what she reads, and what she sees visually. And so this is, you know, redundantly um, providing the same message. Uh, I see some questions coming up. Um, References at the bottom of a slide, great. So um, one thing I've, I've been playing around with this. I, I, again, I don't think any of you should take um, my word at, as, you know, as truth, but uh, I'm constantly trying to ask these questions. And it's great that you guys are asking these questions. What I do is I have a, almost a miniature um, uh, citation, which is just like, author conference name year. So it'll say like Malencia ICRA 20. Um, and then in my notes section, I have the full either link or the full reference or whatever. So that when I send out the presentation in, in PDF form with all the notes attached, all of those, that full information is there to make it easy for people to find. That's an awesome question. And it's awesome that you are um, asking those questions. Um, yeah, I put mine in gray too, uh, so it's not super distracting. Really the one question when I was trying to decide, do I include references, how much do I include? And I don't have an answer to this yet. I would love when, you know, when we have a discussion later uh, or Q&A, if you guys have any thoughts. Has anyone in the world ever, during a presentation, looked up and in the time before they transitioned to the next slide, found that resource and found what they were citing Alice has, awesome, well that answers my question. So sometimes it is on the slides <laughs> where I see you know, like 30 references and they spend five seconds on the slide, that's clearly at the end of the spectrum, that's like not really useful. Putting nothing might also not be useful. So there's some balance, but just the fact that you're asking these questions and thinking critically about that is the first step in the design process. Awesome. So. Now we've talked about structure, we've talked about um, visual aids and designing visual aids. The last thing I wanna talk about and I wanna talk about briefly is how you actually deliver your presentation. And so obviously we're virtually, I hate delivering presentations virtually. The one good thing is I get to reach more people and I really appreciate that all of you guys have your camera on because I enjoy talking to you guys instead of just at my camera. And so there are three kind of main parts of delivery that I wanna talk about. The first is verbal delivery. Verbal delivery is what you say, the words that you use. And so the first point in verbal delivery is, again, to have a conversation with people and not to memorize everything. There are some things that you can memorize. For example, I generally memorize my outline. I sometimes memorize important transitions. 
And sometimes if you want, you can memorize the very first sentence of a presentation or the very last sentence of a presentation if you really wanna like come in strong and, and finish a presentation strong. I wouldn't memorize more than that because again, if you memorize your messages, then you can just talk about these messages instead of memorizing your script. Uh, the second thing when it comes to what you say is I would say do, don't decorate what you're saying with superfluous, obsequious jargon of the elite. Use plain English. It's been shown that plain English is more easily absorbed both by technical people and non-technical people. A lot of times, like obviously we need to define technical terms, but all too often we use more complex words and verbiage than we need to. And then one really powerful tool in verbal delivery, probably my favorite tool and the most important tool is silence. You have to learn to get to love silence. Use silence instead of fillers, those ums, likes, us. When we talk about signal to noise ratio, those ums, likes, us, whatevers, that is just noise. And so it takes practice for sure, but if you can get comfortable with silence, it's really powerful. So in verbal delivery, you want to talk to the audience, not recite to them and you want to use what you say to reinforce those messages that you're getting across. The second part of delivery is the vocal delivery, and that is how you say instead of what you say. And so if anyone, you know, if, if anyone's been trained in singing, for example, you'll know that your voice has a lot of different um, dimensions to it from tone and rate, volume. One of you identified early um, when someone's talking really, really fast and they're just giving you tons of information, there's no place to breathe, that is rate. Speaking fast is not always a bad thing, but if you continuously, continuously do it, it gets in the way. But the tone, the rate, the volume, you can use these things to convey meaning, complexity, importance. You can really lean in. And even when you get quieter, you can focus on a point. And so that's how you can use the rate of what you say or the volume to maybe get someone's attention or to show them that it's important to think about how you say things. And so a lot of times also a big one in how you say things is show people that you are a real person, that you're not you know, a 2015 Siri, that you are passionate and excited because I can almost guarantee you, you don't sound if you sound like you don't want to be there, I'm pretty sure the audience will feel the same way. And so then the last thing about the delivery is the visual delivery. This is how you look. We talked about how slides look, but we wanna talk about how you look. And obviously with practice will come the ability to project confidence through your body, quiet the noise of your body. So you don't wanna be talking with, you know, your hands moving, making a lot of visual noise here because I'm not really adding meaning, I'm just adding noise to what you are seeing. So instead, you want to use deliberate gestures and movement when possible. This is really hard virtually because usually you want big gestures that are, you know, out here and instead virtually you have everything in this space. So that's one of the reasons that I don't like virtual presentations. I also like to use the space in a room you know, to get closer or further away from those who I'm talking to. And so those are some ways, again, just to be deliberate, not to be too noisy with how you are using your body. So we talked about today three main principles of um, presentations, of communication through scientific presentations, adapting to your audience, maximizing signal to noise ratio, and using redundancy. And I hope you guys remember these as core structural principles that you can build on top of with stylistic advice uh, when you design your presentation, when you design your visual aids, and when you deliver your presentation. So I want you to design with a focus on purpose. What do you want your audience to do? I want you to design visual aids by creating sl slides with the assertion evidence style so that you can maximize audience retention. But I want you guys just to be prepared enough going into a presentation that you can just have a conversation with the audience. So I thank you all for coming today. Um, I wanted to leave some time at the end. So in the next 15 minutes, 
we'll send out the um, uh, the exit survey or poll for you guys to finish while you are here. Uh, and I want to leave this space open for you guys to chat, to share ideas with each other, and to ask me any questions. So thank you again for being here, for being mentally and physically present, and for participating and being such a great audience. Thank you very much, Matt. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, and, you know, I feel like even after seeing you last year, I have learned uh, new things now. Um, so thank you very much. Make sure everybody to fill out that poll. And then for everybody who is interested in the certificate program or just doing homework for practice, it will open in like 15 minutes and we'll post all the information on Slack and send it out through email. So keep an eye on that. But if you have any questions for Matt, feel free to stick around and ask them. And I'll stop recording now. <laughs>